All right, thank you everybody. Uh, so we are Watch Your Words. And the premise of our project is really that we are surrounded by machines that are reading what we write and judging us based on whatever they think we're saying. Uh, the results of these systems can really matter. You can imagine a, a chatbot that's doing customer service or potentially, um, potentially even uh, doing a job interview. Uh, these, these use cases are not necessarily new, but what's new is that actually uh, really, really powerful natural language processing systems, uh, an older field concerned with uh, understanding uh, computers understanding language, now any developer can pick up these tools and do uh, pretty unbelievable things. And our premise is essentially what could go wrong when that happens. And so our first belief is actually quite a lot. So you can imagine a non-native speaker looking for um, medical advice from a healthcare bot, uh, not being able to be understood, uh, and essentially going untreated as a result. You can imagine an employee finding out that they've been passed over for a key promotion because an analysis of their Slack messages and their email messages uh, deemed that maybe that they're a poor collaborator. Um, these decisions have real weight, and unfortunately, we have good reason to think that they're quite biased. So uh, as part of our project, we conducted a literature review, uh, finding evidence both that these systems uh, work poorly for um, historically marginalized groups, uh, and also that they can pretty quickly learn very problematic stereotypes and, and potentially exacerbate them, like the idea that some people are better suited for some jobs than others based purely on their gender. Uh, beyond that literature review, we also tested these systems ourselves, and for that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Bernice. Hi, everyone. Um, so what I want to see here are that NLP services are brittle. And what I mean by brittle is that if we give two things that we would consider fairly similar or innocuous, they give unexpectedly different results. Um, and for this is largely true for algorithmic systems, but in the NLP systems that we studied, misspellings, even just differences in spacing, um, and changing the pronouns or proper names within a sentence give different results. Um, we chose natural language processing in particular um, because we believe that the misunderstanding of text may impact groups that are less studied, so different than gender and race that we typically speak about in algorithmic bias, um, and that's extremely interesting to us and important. Um, so to conduct our analysis, we query these natural language processing services of four large tech companies, IBM Watson, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Um, this is done using public endpoints, which can be used by anyone, um, including those with no machine learning or certainly bias mitigation exper expertise. Um, and we pass sentences to these services programmatically using what's called an API. Um, we focus on sentiment analysis here, um, a number, a numerical value expressing whether or not an opinion that is expressed in the text um, is negative, neutral, or positive. Okay, so our first data set of two is of non-native English speakers. Um, and this data set comes from the Tree Bank of Learner English. It's 5,000, a little over 5,000 sentences by adult non-native speakers during a certification exam for English. Um, it was collected at the University of Cambridge, but annotated with these corrections at MIT. The data set consists of an original sentence, um, annotations of things like spelling errors, missing words, out of order words, um, and corrected sentences. And these annotations were done by graduate students at MIT. So the next thing we do is pass these to the APIs, as I've mentioned. Um, and what we find is that spelling and grammar mistakes influence performance in a lot of these cases. So for this example, we have two sentences that we would expect to be very similar. Um, so the original sentence written by the non-native speaker was, that was very disappointed. So they got a couple of things wrong, misspelled, um, and maybe a slightly different form. And so it was corrected to, that was very disappointing. And what you find is that um, there's a large difference in some of these APIs and the results. Um, and then what's very interesting is that those aren't even consistent across the different companies and services. Um, for Google, they find that the corrected sentence is more positive, but for IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon, they find that the original sentence seemed to be more positive. So here we have another example, and this is actually not a spelling error, which for lots of reasons you might expect that natural language tools um, do not work well. This is simply a grammatical error. Um, so uh, the correction changes the word satisfying and replaces with satisfactory, 
There's also a, a small grammatical error. Um, and we actually see something we would hope to see for every single example in our data set, and that is that Microsoft and Amazon find the same sentiment um, for both sentences. Unfortunately, that's not the case for the other two APIs. And um, in addition to that, they are also flipped. So Google finds the first positive, IBM finds the second most positive, and um, if you look at the IBM example, it's by a large margin, this difference. So our second data set um, is where we investigate these four proprietary services um, for the equity evaluation corpus. So this is an existing corpus um, that was building on research on gender and racial bias in sentiment analysis systems. And we extend their work to investigate proprietary APIs like Google and Amazon, which are not explored in this work. Um, so they created a data set using templates like above. Um, person made me feel emotion. Um, and they have a list um, that they're replacing things like person with. So on the left, we see a list that they use for analyzing gender. They might replace it with um, some gendered subject, my daughter, this boy, she, he, him. Um, and then on the right, they, they are exploring both gender and race um, using traditionally African-American names and European names. So one example from this preliminary analysis shows that sentiment for a number of sentences um, with this particular template, really interesting, I think, is um, if you look at the right of this, sorry, it's hard to see, um, my uncle has the most positive sentiment when you say my uncle made me irritated, my mom is next, and with least positivity is she, she made me irrita irritated. So this mostly illustrates just the brittleness and the messiness of these systems that um, seemingly very similar sentences that shouldn't really change between my mom or my mother um, have different results all the way across. And with that, I will pass it on to Joseph to speak a little bit about the pipeline. Thank you. <clears throat> so who's responsible for this brittleness and this uh, set of really odd results, right? Inconsistent results across everything. So I investigated through interviews with 20, co 20 companies who have uh, revenue generating operations in this space, asking them what are they doing to take a look at um, um, how they build their models in terms of normalizing for bias and those kinds of results. And initially what we discovered was this is a very complex ecosystem. There's a shortage of NLP scientists that are out there, a severe shortage. So at the very top, companies like Comcast and HIP uh, Monk and, and uh, Amtrak, they want to build these things, but they don't have the right people. So they're, they're either motivated to build their own uh, API engine or they're going to use the existing API engines that are out there. But even that is hard. And so we end up with a lot of platform vendors. We end up with a lot of third-party consulting companies, a lot of work-for-hire uh, 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 companies that are trying to help these companies develop chatbots and other types of vehicles. By the way, these are economically important because uh, uh, we have these rankings on, in terms of, of uh, net scores uh, that customer VPs are using for actually getting their bonuses and things like these, and net promoter scores. And so this is a way to get the metrics to drive these MPS outcomes. So what we have is a very extended ecosystem, not a lot of expertise, and a reliance on the API providers. And so when you ask, do you care about bias? They all sort of say, well, you know, we don't really think about it. Our focus is on developing a chat bot or something that actually works. So it's, does it work? Functionality is more important than, than taking a look at bias. And so then when you interview more and you say, well, who should be responsible for bias? Is it you or whatever? They all do the same thing. They all point to the API providers and they say, well, it should be Google or Microsoft or that. We expect that they will de-bias, and so we don't really worry about it. And so what we ended up with is an ecosystem that really isn't thinking about this at all. And with that, I'll pass to Eric. Thanks. So I'm going to just summarize this stuff and then give some recommendations, because obviously coming out of this, I think we have some things that we would like to say and recommend for folks to do. Um, and one of the questions I, as a product manager, always ask is, does it, it works, but for whom does it work? <laughs> for whom does it not work? So our, our key findings here, uh, 
three key findings. First, based on what we've seen and based on the, the articulation of harm that can happen from these, we believe that real harm is happening or can happen by using these systems blindly. And we believe that because the second key finding, uh, the APIs in the systems that we tested produced these wildly inconsistent and what we're calling brittle uh, responses. So based on that inconsistency and that brittleness, going back to the first piece, we believe that there's harm that is happening. And the third thing is that, as Joseph just mentioned, nobody's thinking about this, and when they are thinking about it, they're assuming somebody else is taking care of it. That's not a good way to build a responsible system. So we have some recommendations. The first one is for these API providers. Number one, transparency. Could you tell us a little bit about your training data? Maybe you can't tell us exactly what it is, but can you tell us, is it about news? And was that news collected? Was that news corpus collected over the last five years? Is it Twitter? Where is it coming from? There's wildly different sets of people that use and create that training data, and that will impact who's able to use these systems effectively or not. So tell us a little more about what's going on. Number two, um, give us some expectations of when the system should work or when you expect it to fall over. Like you have tested this stuff, you know, where this is gonna work, please tell us a little bit about that. And three, please do some audit for specific biases and publish those results. So you can tell us this works well for these communities, this works less well for these other communities, especially when you're talking about a market with choice, help your customers make an informed choice. Second, third party developers. If you're anywhere in that stack above the API uh, providers and you're doing engineering and development, Here's some recommendations for you. Please be bias aware. <laughs> Understand that these API results can be biased and take responsibility for mitigating that uh, in the products we build. So especially thinking about the language of the humans that are using the thing that you are building. So are those humans, are they English as a first language or English as a second language speaker? Do they use particular dialects or accents um, that may show up in their written language? test against that, so go to the third one here, incorporate those vulnerable groups into your testing. If you're building a government services system for a variety of people, understand what groups exist within that population and test against them. And so that it kind of also incorporates a second one, think about your users, right? <laughs> Who's gonna actually use this? And how that might challenge the APIs that you're relying on. And third, as researchers, for folks who are in academic institutions, there's also recommendations for folks in this space. We would like to see an expansion of the machine, learn machine learning fairness conversation to think about the full stack. Often, and you know, I would say we did this to some extent, we look at a single layer of this, but really what you see with that stack is that the opportunity for, in, um, for bias to come in can happen throughout and it may be not totally transparent. So we have to look at the whole system. We have to look at training data all the way to the users. And so we would like to see more of that happen. Um, potentially with our group, potentially. Many other people can certainly do this. Um, and then we'd like to see some cre creation of templates for disclosure. So even if I work at one of these big companies and I want to tell the world about, hey, this is what our API is good for and is not good for, there's not a standard format for that. I think Data Nutrition Project did a great job of kind of putting something out there into the world. But there could be more of this, of telling and helping companies understand how they can talk about the things that they're building in ways that practitioners who are implementing this stuff can understand. So with that, I would just like to uh, take my moment at the end of this <laughs> to give a big thanks to Hillary specifically for guiding us along this path and to all the MIT uh, Media Lab and Berkman staff who've helped this program exist. Um, and if you'd like to come talk to us, we have a poster out there. We have a little more data on that poster. We'd love to talk to you um, about our project. Thank you very much.